You know, in order to understand something, you have to experience it firsthand in many cases. And I'll give you an example. But, uh, several years back, before Elijah was born, I thought I knew everything about being a parent. I'd read a book or two, and I thought, well, this is how you do it, and this is what you need to do. Well, four children later, I'll tell you, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. <laughs> to understand someone else, you have to walk in their shoes. Find out what are they going through. It's easy to have the solution to someone else's problems that you've never experienced. But when you experience them yourselves, you realize that it's not always as simple as it seems from the outside. Sometimes it can be a bit more complicated. And as we consider this concept of putting ourselves into someone else's shoes, last week we talked about the deity of Christ. We talked about how he is identified by his name as God in the flesh. Before Abraham was born, I am, he said. How as he was walking across the water, I am. Stop being afraid. He identifies himself as God. He's able to do the things, the works, the miracles that only God would have the power to do. And he's able to save. We're going to look at the other side of the identity of Jesus this week. The humanity. That while he is 100% God, he's also a man. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17, the Hebrew writer speaks of this. It says, therefore he had to be make, made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. He was made like his brethren in all things. And the idea being that Jesus understands the things that we face. He understands the hardships. He understands the emotions. He understands the, the pains. He understands the temptations. He came to this earth and walked in our shoes. He understands what we face. He understands, we'll first talk about how we feel. And in Scripture, the Bible speaks of God in a number of places in emotional terms. And as His creation, as those who are created in His image, we understand that we have emotion. We have to be careful that we're not driven by emotion. But the point being in this, the Lord understands us. Contrary to the way that some of us may picture Jesus, we think of Him as this, this individual who is always completely even in his emotion, never smiled, never got upset. He always spoke in the same monotone voice. Jesus was a man just like us, had feelings, just as we experience. And we're going to look at a few of those uh, as, we, as we go through. In John chapter 11, we see as Jesus has come upon a situation where a friend of his has passed away. In John 11, we'll read in verses 33 to 35, Jesus has come to where Mary and Martha are grieving the death of their brother Lazarus. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. He said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. It says, Jesus wept. He knew exactly what he was intending to do. He had already talked to his apostles about it. He had already, had already indicated in the text his plan. But we also see the emotional side of Jesus as he's around his friends, as he's around those that he cares about who are upset. We see the emotion of Jesus. That he has the same kinds of feelings that we deal with. We see another instance in Luke chapter 19 when Jesus begins to weep, but for a very different reason. In Luke chapter 19, we see Jesus weeping over the city of Jerusalem because he knows what's coming. Weeping over the city of Jerusalem because they've rejected the truth. Weeping because he knows judgment is going to come. And as we know about our God, he doesn't want any to perish, but he wants for all to come to repentance. Our God doesn't want, he, he wants everyone to be saved, to come to a knowledge of the truth. And so in Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 41, it says, When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day even you the things which make for peace, 
But now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground and your children within you. They will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. We see Jesus moved in emotion because of what's coming to Jerusalem because they didn't recognize him because they're unfaithful. A city of people that claim that they're God's chosen people have chosen to reject God in the flesh. They've chosen to reject the truth. It caused him grief. It caused him, as it says, to weep over the city because he looks forward. He knows what's coming. He knows what's going to happen. We see Jesus as one who experienced the same feelings. He experienced the feelings of sadness. Whenever a friend was, had passed away, uh, even knowing what he was intending to do, the, the, the grief that comes in seeing a city of those who didn't believe the truth, knowing the destruction, the judgment that was coming. Jesus also is one who experienced anger. In John chapter 2, we read about the anger of our Lord. Now, it's a little bit different than how our anger is sometimes. You know, we get angry and sometimes we come back and realize, well, maybe I shouldn't have been so angry. Maybe I should have thought things out a little bit better. With Jesus, his anger was absolutely a righteous anger. Was angry over the sin that was going on. Angry over the abuse of the temple. Angry over what was going on. That this was supposed to be a, a place of prayer. A place of worship. A place of, of, of revering God and focus upon, uh, upon spiritual things. And he comes to the temple and finds that it's been turned into a place of business. Where there's money changers. Where there's animals being sold. Where it would be much more difficult than was intended to focus upon the Lord and to focus upon what's going on there. And so in John chapter 2 and verses 13 and following, it says, The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. He made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. He poured, the coins, uh, he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Those who were selling the dove, to those who were selling the doves, he said, Take these things away and stop making my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. We see a righteous anger as he sees people who are, sit, who are set up in the temple, a place that is to be a place of prayer, a place of reverence, a place of dedication to God, and they're there to make a profit. He experienced the same emotion that we experience. He experienced the same type of stress, apprehension, and anxiety as he was in the garden, knowing that he was about to be arrested, knowing that he was about to be the sacrifice for sins for all of the world. In the book of Luke, in chapter 22, we have a very vivid picture of the, the stress that Jesus was going through at this time. How difficult it was. In Luke 22, beginning in verse 39, it says that He came out and proceeded as was His custom to the Mount of Olives, and His disciples also followed Him. When He arrived at the place, He said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And He withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and He knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from Me. Yet not My will, but Yours be done. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. In verse 44 is where we really get this vivid picture of just how uh, difficult this is, the amount of stress and anxiety and apprehension that he would have. It says, in being in agony, he was praying very fervently. You know, we talk about the agony that Jesus had on the cross, the agony as he was being scourged, the agony as he was being spit upon and mocked, but there was an agony in the garden as he knew what was coming. That he was getting ready to bear the sin of the world. That he was getting ready to bear not just the physical abuse that he didn't deserve. But also the spiritual consequence of sin. Not sin that he'd committed because he didn't commit any. But he was getting ready to bear the, the, the consequence of your sin and of my sin. And there was an apprehension. It's as he prayed, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. 
there's another way. Let's do that. But there was no other way. It says he was in great agony. And he was praying fervently and it says, And his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. You know, we think about the stresses and the difficulties that we face. I don't think any stress that we face quite would rival what Jesus faced while he was there in the garden praying as he knew he was getting ready to, to go through with the most significant event in all of the history of the world. But he did it anyway. So as we consider our Savior, we know that he's God in the flesh. We also see in Scripture His humanity. We see His emotion and the difficulties that He faced. And we can take great comfort in knowing that when we're dealing with stress, when we're dealing with anxiety, when we're upset, when we're sad, when we're angry, that our Lord understands how we feel. In looking at the deity of Jesus, we see His power. We see the ability that He has to save, and we can take great comfort in that. But on the other side of that, we see that we have a Savior that understands completely what we go through. What a comfort that is. He was a human in emotion. But we also see in physical form, he dealt with the same things that we, that we do. Let's turn now to Philippians chapter 2. And Paul in Philippians 2 talks about the way that Jesus became a man. We see the way that he descended from being in the form of God to be like us. In Ephesians, uh, excuse me, Philippians 2, beginning in verse 5, Paul is, is speaking to a church that was struggling to get along, a church that was struggling to look at one another in the right way, and he says to them, after he's finished charging them to have a humility to, to look at others as more important than themselves, he points them to the example of Jesus. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. If you need to know what it looks like to treat others as more significant, just look to Jesus. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. We see there both the deity and the humanity of Jesus wrapped up in this passage that he was in the form of God as Jesus prayed in John 17. Glorify me with yourself with the glory I had with you before the world was. Or as Paul said in Colossians, all the fullness of deity dwells in him in bodily form. He was in the form of God, but because of his love for you and me, because of the need that we have, because there was no other way. He emptied himself and became a man. But not just any man. You know, as God coming to this earth and Subjecting, subjecting himself to the same limitations and struggles and hardships and pains, you would think, oh, he'd be a king. And he is a king. But it says here he became a servant. He humbled himself to serve. As he said to his disciples, the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many to serve our greatest need in freedom from sin. He humbled himself. He emptied himself and became a man. He humbled himself to become a servant. He humbled himself to be obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, because that was the only way that we could be saved, the only way that our sin could be taken away, the only way that we could be back in fellowship with God, the only way that my foolish decision to sin could be taken care of. That's the love of Christ. That's what it looks like as Paul is saying to these Philippian Christians. Consider one another more important, more significant than yourselves. Look at Jesus. 
who became a man. He had the same physical limitations. He wasn't omnipresent as a man. He had to travel by foot the same way that all the people of his day did. To be in one place at any given time. He subjected himself to the hardships and the pains and the limitations of being a man. He had the same needs, the same feelings. In Luke chapter 4 and verse 2, we read about the temptations of Jesus. And we're going to look at this passage a couple of times for a couple of different reasons. But in chapter 4 and verse 2, the devil is tempting him. It says that he's been in the wilderness for 40 days. He had nothing during the, uh, he ate nothing during those days, and when, uh, when they had ended, he became hungry. You know, I think Luke is really good at understatement there. Forty days and forty nights, he hadn't had anything to eat in over a month. And Luke says, yeah, he was hungry. I don't think hungry quite, quite captures it. We don't often think about this part of Christ's humanity, that he had the same basic needs for food and water. His physical needs weren't just always miraculously met. As a matter of fact, if you go a few chapters over to Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, it says, Soon afterwards he began going around from one city and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God. Twelve were with him. And also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who were contributing to their support out of their private means. You see that Jesus had the ability to multiply the loaves and the fish to feed 5,000. But we also see he didn't misuse the ability that he had. He was limited in the same ways that we are. He relied on the support of others. Jesus was like us in feeling, in physical form. He also subjected himself to being tempted to sin, just like we're tempted to sin. Let's turn back again to Luke chapter 4. And this time we're going to read a little bit longer section there, beginning in verse 1. Where it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and when they had ended, he became hungry. And the devil said to him, If you're the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. And he led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment. The devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it's been handed over to me, and I will give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall, not, uh, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And he led him, up, uh, led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it's written, He will command His angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. You know, when we think about the temptations of Jesus, sometimes it's, Tempting for us to think, well, but he was Jesus. He was the Son of God. He was God in the flesh. He was tempted, but, you know, he was not really. After all, he's the Son of God. He wasn't really going to sin, was he? We don't believe that, that that was really a possibility. It says that he'd been without food and water for 40 days and 40 nights, and that's when the devil came to him. Tell the stone to become bread. The devil tempted Jesus with something that he actually wanted, that he actually needed at that time. The temptation misused the authority, misused the power that you have as the Son of God in order to get what you want. This wasn't just an empty temptation. 
Satan tempted Jesus the same as he tempts us. Jesus wasn't immune to the temptation. It was a very real possibility that he could give in to sin, but he chose not to. But you know, when we think about the temptations of Jesus, often this is this or, or Matthew's account, Matthew chapter 4 of, this, of these same temptations is what we think about. But if you look there at the very end of this passage in verse 13, it says, when the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. What that means is the devil's coming back. And he's going to keep on tempting Jesus again and again and again throughout his ministry right up to the end. The devil's not finished with him. Just like with us, Satan continued to try him. Jesus knows what it's like to go through temptations over and over and over. Let's go to Matthew chapter 16. And in Matthew chapter 16, we see another instance, although it's worded a little bit differently. This is just after they've come to the region of Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus has asked, who do men say that I am? And you know, some say one of the prophets. But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And here's this, this, this wonderful experience that, that Peter is, uh, has gotten this, this answer correct. The Christ, the Son of the living God, blessed are you, Simon Verjona, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And then in the very next section in verse 21, it says, from that time Jesus began to show his disciples he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. Uh, from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. So after Peter has made this, this remarkable confession of faith of the identity of Jesus, Jesus begins to say, okay, now here's what's got to happen. Peter's not so much on board with what Jesus has to say anymore now. Verse 22, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Can you imagine that? You're the son of God. And then he begins to rebuke him. He says, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And notice verse 23, he turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. One of the apostles in that instance was a stumbling block, a source of temptation for Jesus. Satan will use whoever and whatever he can to try to get us to fall into sin. But as we consider the temptation of Jesus, it's also with the victory he won over sin and over death is a great comfort to us. Let's go back again to the book of Hebrews and look in chapter 4. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 it says, We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who's been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. He can sympathize in our weakness. He was tempted in all points, in every point. He knows what we're going through whenever we, we want to do something, we're, we're, we feel pulled to do something, compelled to do something, but we know it's wrong. Jesus knows what it's like to go through that temptation. To have that lie that Satan tells, it's not really a big deal. Jesus knows what it's like to go through that sort of temptation, but he never gave in. He knows how difficult it is to go through it, and he understands what we're dealing with. He can sympathize, it says. That's an emotional term that is to feel for, to have compassion for uh, us whenever we're going through temptation. Hebrews 2 verses 17 and 18 says he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. We have a Savior who understands our temptation, who can sympathize with our temptation, who was tempted in all points, who was tempted by the devil continually. Which means he knows what we're going through and he stands ready to help. 
Because chapter 4 and verse 16 says, Let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. One of the greatest times of need that we have. And contextually what he's dealing with here is times of temptation. He's able to come to the aid because he knows what it's like. So as we consider, as we're going through a, a set of lessons looking at who is this Jesus. He's the fulfillment of prophecy. He's the fulfillment of every sacrifice that we read about in the law of Moses in the book of Leviticus. He's God in the flesh. Able to save completely. The one with all authority, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And He is one who understands everything we go through. Understands how we feel. Understands our pain. Understands our sadness. Understands the sicknesses. Understands the things that we go through when we're struggling. Because as we said at the very beginning, in order to fully understand someone, we've got to walk in their shoes. Jesus came to this earth. And walked in our shoes. And so he does understand, the Bible tells us. He put himself in our shoes to be tempted. To face hardship, to face weakness, to feel pain. What a Savior. And the application of that is very simple. We're going to have an invitation in just a moment. We invite you to follow the one who understands what you're going through, knows everything you've done, and loves you enough that He gave Himself for you to take the punishment for each and every one of our sins. Would you choose to follow Him? One who has the power to save, and one who understands everything we go through. If you need to recommit yourself to following Him tonight, if you've turned away from following Him closely as a Christian, we'll pray for you and help you however we can. Or if you need to make the decision tonight to become a child of God, to begin following Him, you'll come confessing your belief in Him, choosing to turn away from sin. You can be united with Him in the waters of baptism and walk out of here completely free from sin. If we can assist you in some way with that tonight, would you come while we stand and while we sing?